book, I uh, came out with my first book in August, uh, Bloomberg published it, and that's really what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. Actually, it really was two years ago that we all invited me to a FPA uh, function. It was the uh, William K. Tell lecture in uh, late 07, and uh, of course at that time, the dollar was crashing, the worse than it is today. And uh, uh, I presented about the dollar, and the title of the piece, uh, no, no, I think it was Rainstorm on his phone, it looked be a, a, a title that would be a, you know, like grab you with attention. And it came up with Making Sense of the Dollar, which I ended up liking it so much that I uh, used it as the title of my book. <laughs> so uh, but I guess like uh, for me, uh, the thing I think that you want to keep in mind through, throughout this, I think, is that uh, you're probably familiar when you buy a stock or you buy a bond, you're buying a claim on a future currency that we can model and you can understand the present value of. When it comes to currencies, when you sell a currency, you gotta buy another currency. There's no such thing as getting out of this currency universe. You sell the dollar, you gotta buy something else. Who's that dollar? Another currency. And so uh, it's very much a relative case, like a relative value proposition. And the key story, I think, that uh, I keep in mind, and I think that uh, when, I, when I come to these kind of presentations, I'm lucky if I can remember four or five things that the speaker said. And so, uh, and I think that there's a reason why people can remember their story. And so one story, I think, that uh, they'll give you a sense of what we're gonna talk about tonight. The story about the two boys being chased by a tiger. One of the boys stops and puts on a pair of gym shoes. And his friend says, what are you doing? You can't outrun a tiger by putting on running shoes. And his friend says to him, I don't have to outrun the tiger. I didn't have to outrun you. <laughs> so it's really true about the dollar that, uh, that uh, we're going to talk about, uh, most of what I want to talk about tonight is trying to put uh, what the U.S. in a historical context and relative to other countries. And I think that the first thing I think to, uh, to acknowledge, I think, is that right now, uh, people are as pessimistic about the United States as they ever have been. But you know, they're not being unpatriotic. People like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, they're not being unpatriotic. I think that wondering that America is about to decline is as old as America itself. It's really, as I want to say, as uh, worried about it as uh, American and apple pie. Uh, the first uh, guy is uh, supposed to be. Uh, is that right? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the first guy is, uh, is, re is really Adam Smith, because I could find Montesquieu. Montesquieu is this, a French uh, lawyer, political philosopher, who began this, who came up with this idea that you could not have a republic, republic representative form of government, Republican with a small r, form of government in a large republic, in a large piece of territory. The ancient Greeks believed that, but then Montesquieu sort of codified into, into, a, like, into political philosophy, if you will. So right from the very start, people doubted that the United States as a republic form of government could survive. And of course, there was an early time when we did have, not the Civil War, but when Aaron Burr led a group of people trying to break away from the west of the Appalachian Mountains. So it's possible that the republic couldn't have survived. But of course, here we are today and we've survived. But all along the way, you think about even in our lifetimes. Remember uh, Khrushchev pounding his shoe at the table at the UN? He said, Soviet Union will bury us, bury the West. Remember how uh, Kennedy gets elected, uh, besides uh, his father, of course, uh, we know that uh, he campaigned on a premise of a, of a missile gap, that General Eisenhower left the country vulnerable to the Soviets. A missile gap. Even back then, we were, worried, we were worried about the Soviet Union eating our lunch. Fast forward till I was in uh, graduate school, and you got people like myself having to read all these Japanese management books. <laughs> Japan was gonna eat our lunch. They were going to replace it. Remember what happened when the, uh, the, the real estate under the Imperial Palace was worth more than the state of California right, during the bubble period. Right? They, they bought all these great, right, they bought Rockefeller Center. Of course, we bought it back from them a bit cheaper. Right? A lot cheaper. Right? Then when the euro was born, 1999, people said, once there's an alternative dollar, we're going to flock to it. The euro is going to replace the dollar. As we'll see tonight, none of these things turned out to be true. <coughs> well, I suggest to you that through this, uh, maybe starting in not, around 9-11, maybe, uh, maybe it was with the, uh, the uh, mutual fund corporate crisis of the early 2000s, maybe it was uh, this recent financial crisis, but the, the level of doubt, the belief that the U.S. is in a, in a structural decline, 
that uh, the curtain is closing on the American empire is widely believed. But slowly, like I say, this is part of American tradition. This is part of the discourse of American tradition. But slowly, in the last year, year and a half, there's been a reply to these arguments. And I would put my book within that context of a reply to the declinists. And I don't come to this position naturally. As an undergraduate <coughs> and in graduate school, I studied with the American historian revisionists, the left wing interpretation of American history. And so I, be I believe that the, uh, the US had not just spread democracy and freedom, it also spread an empire. <coughs> and learning from, say, the William Appleman Williams, and his students, I took seriously the open door, which they say was really the pivotal thing in American foreign policy. Think about what's happening. So from their point of view, the frontier, the domestic frontier is closed. We're no longer expanding across the continent. We've now gotten to the Pacific Ocean. The next stage then is going overseas quickly. Partly from the sort of revisionist school is we don't want to address our domestic problems, classes, race, gender, all the kind of problems that domestic economy may face. So instead of facing them, we have the frontier. We kept on externalizing it to the frontier. The open door notes then became the latest effort of that after the domestic frontier closed, we went international. That becomes a pivotal point in American history, to this radical view of American history. But what took me, I used those analytic tools to come at, I use those analytic tools to look at what's the status of America. And my <coughs> conclusion, using those, those same analytic tools that are critical of U.S. foreign policy, I found that, lo and behold, the U.S. empire and the dollar, which is partly its symbol, is much more durable than our friends and our enemies would suggest. Of course, now this is just a list of all these possible cons these concerns that people have about the crisis, the role of the dollar, Here's what it looks like to me on one hand. This is the largest economies in the world. As you can see, the, I mean, the US, 14.3, these are trillions of dollars. So what this means then is that the US economy is three times larger than the second largest economy in the world. That has not changed because of the financial crisis. It hasn't changed because the world didn't like uh, President Bush. This has not changed because the American households are in debt. This hasn't changed because the U.S. government's in debt. The U.S. economy is the world's biggest economy, three times bigger than number two. Now, one of the successes of America, and I suspect that many of you, uh, like myself, you sort of, uh, we like to know a happy story. We know that a lot of people are critical of the United States, and we need to, uh, I hopefully it'll give you, is, uh, is like uh, uh, quivers, uh, arrows in your quiver for the next time you go to a cocktail party, and people begin telling you how bad the United States is. When you look at the top 14 countries in GDP per capita, all of them, excuse me, they have higher per capita GDP than the US, all of them have a population smaller than California. Most of them have smaller populations than New York City. It's one thing to bring success to a small country. And I think that another thing is we know when it comes to China, over a billion people, G GDP is different for them. And the other thing that strikes me about this is that the U.S. share of world GDP, I know there's some people who think, well, Brazil is rising, uh, Indonesia, uh, China, all these countries are rising, it's true. The U.S. share of the world's GDP has remained relatively constant. I had my, uh, my assistant, I, I wanted to go back and further than this, because you'll, you'll find that roughly on the eve of World War I, the U.S. economy was roughly 25% of the world's economy. That's been a relatively constant phenomena. Yes, who makes up that other 75% may change? But the U.S. share has remained relatively constant. And this is an amazing kind of feat in a time when many people think the U.S. is in decline. Our GDP is still three times bigger than number two, and we remain relatively constant, 25% of the world's, everything the world produces. And this is kind of a fun one to put together. We looked, at the, we looked at the states in the U.S., the GDP of individual states in the United States. So California's GDP is roughly the same as Brazil's. New York State, uh, we, have a, we have a colleague from Canada tonight. 
And to the uh, New York State's GDP is roughly the size of Canada's GDP. Uh, Michigan, like the former auto capital of the world, that's Taiwan's GDP. <laughs> Illinois, where I grew up, is Turkey's GDP. I put this chart, I put this kind of map together, just get to put it in perspective how, like, uh, I want to say, like, just how humongous the U.S. really is. And even though we might convince other people otherwise, size does matter. Think about this current banking crisis. The banking assets of the top four German banks are worth four times GDP. What that means is if they have a 5% drawdown on asset value, that hits them 20% of GDP. Follow me? The U.S. banking assets at its peak was half of GDP. Size matters. We can absorb, this is not an existential crisis for the United States. This is like uh, having maybe a finger cut off or a hand cut off. But maybe it's more like a chameleon's tail that's going to grow back. Even if you assume modest growth in the United States for the next couple of years, that means that by roughly 2013, we will be past that peak, our old peak in GDP. A few years away. And we can do that partly because of how big we are. Demographics. Many people think that uh, the U.S. is an aging population. I, I feel like I'm aging. But, the, uh, but when it really comes to it, this is another powerful strength of the United States that most people who are complaining about the uh, U.S. debt or worrying about the future of the United States, they don't really like come to grips with. Demographics. The demographics are in our favor. That is the United States' favor. Look what's going to happen. Let's think about Japan. Their population is already beginning to shrink. By next year, by the end of 2010, they will have 3 million fewer workers than they did in 2005. 3 million fewer workers. Think about what that does to your GDP. Unless you have strong productivity to offset that. Japan does not have that. The productivity is lower than ours. Look at what's going to happen in Europe. 2030, so we speed up, we fast forward, and now we're feeling older. <laughs> your population remains stagnant, and yet the population distribution will shift, obviously, then to a much older population. The number of workers you have for a retired person. Look what's going to happen in the United States. We're going to have 65 million more people in the United States. 65 million more people than we do today. And where are we going to put it all? So the amazing thing is that, uh, and I found this when I was doing some research for, for the book, even as early as President Washington's administration, the average American lived, the average male American, I don't have, sorry, I don't have uh, female numbers, it's a problem with the time. The uh, average male worker lived 20 years longer than the average Brit and was about six inches taller. What is that about America? Is it our drinking water? I don't think so. I think what it was, population density, that is, we're a lot less dense than Europe, and we had more meat in our, in our diets. Sorry if any of you are vegetarian, it's just but it turns out to be you need more protein, especially then, right? And so what happens then is that the, uh, the, the fact that we have relatively lower population density in the United States is a very powerful force that's going to continue to allow us to grow rapidly and for innovation. We have very low population density today, outside, of course, the coasts. And that's part of the problem where we have it with, uh, uh, with gasoline prices. You know, here on the East Coast, we spend less than 4% of our income on gasoline. It's like twice or three times that in some of the western states. Another thing about the popula our population is during the 1980s, 1990s, the U.S., if you will, imported roughly a million immigrants a year. More than any other country, more than all the other countries combined of immigrants as opposed to like political refugees. Like they're trying to escape a war on their border, they go next door. People who want to live in the United States, we take in took in during those years, 80s and 90s, so that's crossing both Republican and Democratic administrations, and more people than any, anybody else in the world. And I'm suggesting, I know some of you might have a problem with that, I know that uh, uh, when I watch these Sunday morning talk shows, it looks like Pappy Cannon has a problem with that, but I think that the future of the United States is partly going to rest on our people and dynamic population growth. America, after all, is a, is a country of immigrants, 
but not just immigrants, but you think about what we do for our people. And I don't say do for our people, like the government, like we have a big social safety net or a big package of goods we get as being citizens of the richest, most powerful country in the world. Here's what we do for ourselves, really. Average education in the United States, 12.3 years. Highest in the world, close to Canada. Just amazing. So, I don't know, some of you say, well, it's great you have more quantity, what about the quality? It turns out that most of the education problems we have in the United States are on a primary school and a high school level. And it seems they have to do with the disparity of income and wealth in the United States, not, the, not our higher education. In fact, if you look at some of these numbers, the U.S. spends then tw- basically at, look at 2.6% on education, more than Europe and Japan. In 2007, the U.S. had 1,000 PhDs in computer science. India produced 50. So he's worried about education. 17 of those top 20 universities in the world are here in the United States. What about India? The top two universities in India are ranked in the world, not by me, but ranked in the, these world catalogs, between 200 and 300, depending on which, which, which litmus test you look at. China's top three schools are between 300 and 400 level. And this is another side of these immigration story. Roughly a third of all the students that go outside their country to study, they come here to the United States attracted to our schools. It's not just about the, it's not just, it's not just that we have a large economy, it's not just that we have high education. But how are we thinking about the future? You look at, uh, I think Lenin called it the commanding heights of an economy. What are the future, what are the future industries? And I, I, I cannot pick winners any better than any of you can, but two that struck me were nanotechnology, Instead of how big things get, how important size is, it's really shrinking it, right? And, of course, uh, biotechnology. But here's what, uh, here's our research and development. This is how you spend for the future. You invest in the future through research and development. The U.S. spends 2.6% of the biggest GDP in the world on research and development. China and Russia spend a lot less. Percentage of GDP, this is not even talking in dollar terms. And it costs them the same amount to buy, say, a build a silicon wafer factory as it does for the United States. Look at the second point. Many people say the U.S. has lost its innovative edge. I think that's a subjective feeling that tells you more about the angst of American psyche than it does about the facts. The facts, IBM last year filed for more patents than China, India, Brazil, Russia, the BRICS put together. Amazing. There's only four countries that spend more money on research and development as a percentage of GDP than the United States. Two of them are very small, Iceland and Israel, and two of them, as you can imagine, in technology space, Sweden and Finland. Now, here's more about those industries of the future. So I look at nanotechnology and biotechnology, and it's very clear about the U.S. dominance in both of those nanotechnology we over 50% of those patents. Look at that, the revenue in the biotechnology space. We roughly three quarter, a little bit more than, uh, say, 80% of all the revenue being generated from biotechnology. I'm not saying go out and buy a biotech company or go out and buy a nanotech company. I'm saying that these industries, when you think about the U.S. competitive edge, you want to think about not just its size, wealth of the people, its education, its human capital, but also the, what we're doing with investment capital. Many people worry about the dollar losing its place in the world. <coughs> One way to think about the dollar's place in the world is think about the different functions it has. One of those functions is trade. Think about all the commodities from energy to foodstuffs to fibers, all denominated and traded, quoted in U.S. dollars. When China buys iron ore from Australia, they pay in U.S. dollars. They don't pay in an NIMBY. pay in U.S. dollars. You look at that, that country, you know, so you can appreciate that, that a lot of commodities are priced in dollars. So if you're a commodity exporter, like Brazil, you get a lot of dollars for your goods. Or if you're an OPEC country, right? But look at Italy. 
little bit more than 50% of Italy's exports, which are not commodities, are invoiced in U.S. dollars. That's what this chart, that's what this table measures, is countries, the use of the dollar. And a lot of those goods are coming to the United States. A lot of, a lot of Italy's, for example, Italy's, uh, uh, Italy sells a lot of uh, porcelain. In fact, all those porcelain uh, bathroom fixtures, for example, in Egypt primarily come from Italy. Who would have ever thunk it? Right? Italy's exports are not commodities, and yet the bulk of them, a little bit more than 50%, I should say, are invoiced in U.S. dollars. So, so you know, you appreciate that South Korea, Malaysia, Thailand, they're tied into the U.S. business cycle and the uh, high-tech cycle. Right? But their biggest trading partner is not the United States. It's China. <coughs> Even the world's second largest economy, Japan, Look at that. How much of Japan's uh, exports, which are no commodities, are invoiced in dollars? And this has been fairly stable over the years, invoicing currencies. One roll of the dollar, is, we would say, is a numerator. It's the benchmark for the world. You know, the foreign exchange market is $3.2 trillion a day, average daily turnover. It's really a mind-boggling number. I've tried to come up with all kinds of different comparisons to make sense out of it, but it's just really a mind-boggling number. In one week, uh, we trade in foreign exchange enough, roughly speaking, right, roughly to buy everything the U.S. produces in a year. In three weeks, enough currency volume, enough turnover in the foreign exchange market to buy everything the world produces in a year. Already this month, we've covered world trade for the year. It's a huge market. And yet the dollar remains on one side, of about something roughly 80-85% of trades, the dollar's on one side of it. The Bank for International Settlements is the most authoritative source for this, and they have a report, a survey they do every three years. The next one's coming out next year. So we'll get to some updated figures. But I'd be very surprised if these numbers change very much. One of the things that amazes people, gets a lot of people talking, right, is that so China's accumulating dollars. China has roughly $850 billion worth of treasuries out of its $2.1 trillion of reserves. Many people are worried that we'll do whatever China wants, right? So whether it was Lyndon Johnson or uh, or, uh, or uh, the Godfather, I always get the two confused. But the idea of keeping your friends close and your enemies closer, right? That the uh, the dollar's role, right, in the reserves. That if you owe someone a little bit of money, right, you're in debt. If you owe them a lot of money, you're a partner. Many people think that China is our partner. Some people write in the Financial Times articles about the G2. The dollar remains today the world's most important reserve currency. What this, what this graph shows you is I think 1995, there's a few years before the run-up to the Eurozone. The dollar is the blue line. It made up roughly 60% of the world's reserves. And here we're not looking at the Euro, but we're looking at its constituent members, constituent parts. The ECU, the European Currency Unit, the Deutschmark, and the French franc. Very small part of the world's reserves, partly because they were pairing them back and they prepared for the Euro to have monetary union. And look what happens. Roughly, 1995, so this is the, uh, the 12-year span, the dollar share remains relatively constant. It fluctuates a little bit. When you think about how much the dollar's price has fluctuated, it's remained very constant. The Euro share, in recent years, once it got caught up to some kind of equilibrium, and it's funny thing about the equilibrium, if you go back a little bit before here, say 1990, the ECU, the Deutschmark, the French franc made up roughly 25% of the world's reserves. Today, roughly 25% of the world's reserves. That is, the, AQ, the Euro is, a, is the uh, sum of its parts. It might be, I mean, the thing is, I think that in a, when you think about these kinds of uh, issues, uh, politics, economics, political economy, many people see it as a zero-sum game. There's a winner and there's a loser. But a lot of this is a non-zero-sum. Right now, and I think one of the lessons from the crisis will be that the countries, developing countries, cannot have enough reserves. They're going to continue to accumulate reserves. And central banks accumulate reserves. They can hold more dollars and more euros. They don't have to make such a fine choice as if to buy euros requires a selling of dollars. So here we've survived 2001, 
We've survived that crisis. We've survived this crisis. And the dollar share since the uh, since the middle of last year, so giving the end of Q2 of 08 <coughs> until the end of Q1, which is the most recent data we have, the dollar share reserves during the crisis actually went up slightly, percentage point or so. Here's what it looks like in the most recent quarters. Given the kind of hit that we've taken, given that a Brazilian supermodel won't accept dollars, <laughs> given that the, uh, right, there's some, uh, there's some uh, East Coast, uh, I'm sorry, East Side, it's to me it's like the East Coast, uh, shops are refused, they say they will, they'll accept euros, right? Uh, I found out when I was writing my book that Taj Mahal last year stopped accepting dollars. Despite all that, the dollar share of world reserves, dollar shares in invoicing currency, the dollar share role in uh, pricing commodities, nothing has changed. <clears throat> you know, we think that, think that like, uh, sort of uh, Adrian Maslow was a psychologist at the University of Chicago. He said, if all you have is a hammer, every crop looks like a nail. <laughs> and so, of course, people on Wall Street, economist types, <laughs> they'll think about, they'll try to interpret problems as economic problems, because they've got the economic solution. When we think about power, the elements of power, I recognize the power of the U.S. military. And that is the, uh, the saying that a, uh, a superpower has a super currency. And so I'm, uh, these numbers, I'm not, uh, I'm like, uh, as, as I suggested, I mean, I was, especially when younger, influenced by this uh, revisionist school of American history. I'm a tree hugger. <laughs> I'm a peacenik. But I recognize a very important part that the military plays in the U.S. and making the U.S. a powerful country. Of course, last year, we spent more money, roughly as much money as the rest of the world did, we spent on defense. The people who we, countries who we think are our military rivals, China, Japan, maybe Japan, India, Russia, coming even close to this. You think about what we're doing right now. We're fighting two wars thousands of miles away. No other country or group of countries could do that to project their power that far away. Think about the Navy. Our, our tonnage, I mean, I guess that's, that's how they, they measure things, like how much tonnage of shipage you have in Navy. 17 times number two. The US, I want to say we also get it, ironically, we get it, unfortunately, perhaps, on the cheap as well. The US spends right now equivalent roughly 4.1% of GDP on the military. During Eisenhower, during the peak, during that, that wasn't even the peak of the Cold War. Korean War was winding down. Cold War was really picking up. Ten percent of GDP on defense under Eisenhower. And unfortunately, I think the war is costing us very little, in real terms, very little money. One percent of GDP. Vietnam in 1970 was at 1.6 percent of GDP. Funding two wars without a draft for less than we spent for Vietnam. The dominance is not just, I mean, despite the military being overstretched, it's not just the dominance in the land, controlling the navies, airplanes, but it seems that things that I read suggest that the next sort of uh, frontier, if you will, is space. And it looks like, just given how much money the U.S. spends on defense, and not just on defense, but also on research and development in defense issues, I've got to believe my money would be on the U.S. to dominate space, if it doesn't already. So what I do, is, what I do then in the book is really look at different elements of the dollar. And sort of, uh, I came across an interesting quote that said, uh, it's not what we know that hurts us. So we, what we know it just ain't so. And so what I do in the book is I, I can fully appreciate that many people we always we have a, we have a lot of a lot we have a lot of many things but we don't have a lot of mind share time to think about these things and so what I did is each chapter in the book looks at a myth looks at like conventional wisdom like uh, I just put a few of them here does a trade deficit really reflect U.S. competitiveness or does a current account deficit drive the dollar can you have too much money and I'd like to try that one out. <laughs> uh, for, for me, I mean, things like labor market flexibility, that's the one that I, I just want to talk about here, because we've got, ri we've got, despite a recovering economy, we've got still rising levels of unemployment. Many people think that the key to American success is our labor market flexibility. 
I'll tell you how I experience labor market flexibility. My boss can fire me for any good reason, or no good reason. I'm hired at will. My father got a pension fund. When he retired, he got a fixed amount of money. What I get is the money put into account, and then a Chinese menu to pick which mutual fund I should invest in. Flexibility of the labor market means that my wages, wages of Americans, don't have to keep pace with inflation or productivity. My father was a plumber. And this is before they became drain surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> he was on one man's income, blue collar man who not the sharpest knife in the drawer took him five years to get out of high school. He was able to support a wife, a stay at home wife, and a family of four children. A family of six people on one man's blue collar income. We can't do that anymore. So here's, what, here's how I see happening. People talk about this crisis as being a. People, somehow, many people, many of my friends think that, especially on Wall Street, they think that uh, mom and pop, who couldn't afford a house, pulled a fast one on Harvard's MBAs. I don't believe it for a second. Somehow they think that Americans live beyond their means and that's the source of this crisis. They think that living beyond one's means, almost a puritanical value, is wrong. And I want to suggest to you that the moral, the real moral thing we got to think about is why did the means keep pace with the American dream? What's the American dream? My wife might tell you that the American dream is to have Imelda Marcos come over to borrow shoes from her. <laughs> <laughs> I think the American dream is pretty straightforward. Having a house, a car, kids in college. You know how much it costs to put a kid through college right now? A kid was born today, roughly eight years of median family income. You can't afford the American dream. And here's why. Here's what's happened. So my father was able to support a family of six. But then something happened to the social contract that let wages link to productivity and inflation. It's not coincidental that women entering the workforce came about precisely at that time, in that moment in time, when men's wages began declining relative to inflation, relative to productivity. So how did the household make ends meet? Women increasingly joined the workforce. We, we produce a lot of things in the United States and one of the things we can produce is a virtue out of a necessity. <laughs> but that wasn't good enough. Partly because, women, as you know, women get paid roughly 70% 70 of what men do for those same kind of jobs. So that's not enough to make ends meet still. So the next thing we do, get those kids, those teenagers working at earlier ages. Now, when I look at people like people who come into like going to college, for, look, at, look at their resume, people need to have some kind of public service. They need to have working experience going into high school, or excuse me, going to college. That's still not good enough. Husband working, wife working, teenage kids working, that's still not good enough. Credit fit the rest of it. And this credit crisis, and why do these banks lend to these called ninja loans, no income, job, or assets? They didn't loan based on someone's ability to repay it. They lend it based on the expected value of their collateral. So I'll loan you money for your house. If you can't afford it, so what? I'm going to take your house as a bank, and the price is going up. That's why there was a subprime problem with mortgages, but there wasn't with subprime autos. You know what happens right when you drive that auto off the, sh off the, off the floor, right? You lose a third of its value. You can't lend it to someone based on the collateral of the car. You can on your house, though. So, so I, I mean, this is just like one, sort of one of the myths flexibility of the U.S. labor market that I try to look at. And I, I conclude that the real <coughs> strength, the real uh, secret, if, if there is such a thing, to American economic prowess isn't about labor market flexibility, but capital market flexibility. Think about a guy who drops out of college and he goes to the bank, any bank, your favorite bank, Brown Brothers, City Bank, right? <laughs> and he say, say that, the guy goes to them and says, uh, look, I just dropped out of college. Will you loan me money to build computers in my garage? And we laugh at Michael Dell. And how did he float his company? Credit cards, which now can be packaged into an asset-backed security. David Bowie, right? I think he plays music, right? Uh, he sells hundreds of millions of dollars of the DVDs and CDs every year. Imagine going to the bank and saying, Look, I've got my money for 2009, but give me my money for 2011, 2012. We laugh at him. What's that? 
right? New Jersey, forget about it or something like that, huh? But today, you can buy David Bowie asset-backed bonds, backed by his income stream that's guaranteed by his sales. Flexibility. They said, I grew up in Chicago. United Airlines had gone bankrupt several times. Every time they come out of bankruptcy, we buy their junk bonds. We, that is the market, buys their junk bonds. High yield bonds. Right? There's a place for them in the people's portfolios. So about, the book basically then looks at about 10 different myths about that people have about the dollar, about trade, about foreign exchange. And I try to show why either the myths are just wrong or that the facts are much more complicated. And lastly, uh, a disclaimer uh, that I think uh, uh, gives you a good sense of uh, sort of the flavor of the book as well, uh, that, uh, that while these are very serious issues, we can't take ourselves all that seriously and know that, I think it was like a, uh, uh, like the, that story about the five blind Indian men who stumble on an elephant. But they don't know it's an elephant because they're blind. So one guy feels a tail and says it's a snake. Another guy feels a leg and says, no, it's a tree. Another guy feels a side and says, no, it's a wall. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your attention tonight and sharing the part of the elephant that I'm feeling. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. I would say it put a little differently. I would say those other currencies were undervalued under Bretton Woods, and it took them a long time to appreciate, to get caught up. But once they're caught up, like they have been for the last 20 years or so, there's movement. But net net, I'm not so sure about the change. And I hear what you say about Europe. Europe is a huge economy, and especially if they get new members in. It will rival the United States. It is. Yeah. Okay? But well, what is that? Who do you call, for example? Is there an EU president? They are, they are having right now, a, their, their governing structure is like the U.S. Articles of Confederation. You require unanimity in decision making, no power to tax. Look what's happened now during this financial crisis. Who is going to bail out Iceland, Ireland, Hungary, Czech, right? You know, the IMF has stepped in to fill the breach, to fill the vacuum that the European institutions cannot fill yet. Perhaps one day they can. Many people thought the euro was going to replace the dollar. It hasn't. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that the U.S. Is, doesn't have problems. The US, we, have our, we have plenty of our share of problems. But I would say that my, the conclusion of my argument really is that who, who do you want to bet on who's going to be able to deal with those problems? <coughs> and I think based on the different elements of power, based on things like demographics, I'd say my money would be the U.S. could resolve these crises and questions easier than other countries. And if we emerge from this crisis, with a better banking system, with a uh, uh, with a more dynamic economy, and I guess what businesses have done. I mean, businesses are very mean and lean outside the financial sector. I have two questions. First, the basic question: Is it possible you will put all of the graphs on the internet so it would be possible? Sure. Because we, we can arrange that with FPA. Because yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, this is yeah. We'd be happy to. Yes, because it's certainly a very good therapy under this country. And another question. Um, I'm not economic, so I'm wondering how much of GDP of America came from production of something real, and how much come from speculation? Uh, a very, very good question. I do not have a clue. Partly because, and this is why I don't have a clue, and there's a big debate now in Wall Street and the financial centers. What is speculation, what's not? For example, one of the big stories with gold last week, the gold finally moved above $1,000 an ounce, was that Barrick Mines, a gold company, had sold more gold in the forward market than they're going to produce this year. And they had to buy it back. Is that speculation? 
What about when an endowment buys, uh, they say, okay, we've got a lot of stocks, we've got a lot of bonds in our endowment, now we want commodities. And part of those commodities we want is gold. Is that speculation? So I, I, I think that's sort of like, a, I want to say, sort of like what Freud said about dreams. Madmen and rational people, you can't tell the dreams apart. <laughs> <laughs> and I would uh, more of my question. What happened when it would be impossible to sell bicycle here for hundred dollars, and China would have seven dollars for this bicycle, or sneakers want to sell here for hundred dollars, and then the nature has five? I'm not talking about moral. Right. I'm not talking about justice. Just in cynical, pragmatic way. Right. What happened with this economy? Yes, now I, I hear you. I have a friend who uh, didn't believe me about this either, and uh, he came over from London, and he, he came in and I showed him a McDonald's. And he couldn't believe how cheap the Big Macs were. And he ate Big Mac after Big Mac after Big Mac. And no matter how many he ate, the British pound was still where the British pound was, and the dollar still where the dollar is. That is to say that capital flows, like I mentioned to you, foreign exchange, $3.2 trillion a day. Capital flows are more important than trade flows. So we look at the trade flows like buying goods, buying goods and services. Those are trade flows. Capital flows, out, like they, they overwhelm. What counts that is what makes the U.S. attractive. Why is the dollar falling right now? I don't think the dollar is falling because people don't like the U.S., because they're in debt, or any of those reasons. The dollar is falling right now because people are paid to be short the dollar. U.S. interest rates are lower than Europe. That means that for speculators, for corporations, for money managers, they buy euros, they get paid a little bit more than if they have dollars. If you want to sell, if you want to buy the dollar, you have to pay for that privilege to own the dollar right now. Mark, uh, you rightly point out that $850 billion of China's reserve of the dollar of their 1.3 trillion. It's clearly in their interest that the dollar at least maintain its value will go higher. And yet every week or every other week, some Chinese official uh, last week in Europe, uh, the vice chair, was suggesting that, boy, oh boy, this is terrible. We may not keep our treasury bonds for quiet. What game do you think they're playing? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think that we know when American politicians are lying because their lips move. <laughs> right? But somehow, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but somehow, when a Chinese politician or a Russian politician says something, we believe them at their word. <laughs> what are we doing? Right? I think that <laughs> political, science, political scientists have this uh, very clever way to fancy, you know, make these things more complicated. They say there's a distinction between a declaratory policy, what you say, and operational policy, what you do. And so I'd say first, watch what the Chinese do, don't pay attention to what they say. But for, for us, they're like common investors as opposed to policymakers. Here's what they're doing. Second half of last year, they increased their treasury holdings by 38%. January, February, March, they were still buying treasuries. They took a little bit of profit in April. They came back and were buyers in May. Tomorrow, we'll see what they did in June. I would not be surprised if they still bought, whether they bought treasuries, corporate bonds, U.S. equities. They were net buyers of U.S. assets. In some ways, I'd say China has done more about the strong dollar than the U.S. has. They are buying dollars almost every day, accumulating them. I think this is going to be, this is a, they're paying themselves in a tough corner. But I think that they have, uh, they become our partner as far as they don't want, they want, don't want to see the dollar fall. They've got a lot of money in it, two po roughly $2.1 trillion. You talk about the dollar and, you know, the trade in denominated dollars, the trade is filled in denominated dollars, and that doesn't go into other currencies. That also because there is a common dollar, it's because the other currencies and other markets do not have debt to absorb. You know, I mean, if they buy all the euros up, what the hell are they going to do with it? And, you know, right. the European uh, asset markets, right. all their inflation. You know? right. no, that's a very important point. And partly, I'd say why gold is going up. I don't think gold is going up today because people have lost faith in the dollar or because they're worried about inflation. These other inflation measures that we can find are not really showing inflation. I think they're buying gold because of liquidity. It's liquidity driven. Why, where's this liquidity coming from? Well, all these central banks are pumping out lots of money into the world economy. But for me, that's the, uh, behind the dollar for me stands the US Treasury market. That is, I, I tell a story that the, uh, sort of the American history story would be in the 19th century, the US was the safety valve for the world's excess population. 19th century, uh, excuse me, the uh, after the end of, uh, well, that continued, right? But the U.S. also then became the, uh, after World War II, we became the buyer. That's how Europe and Japan rebuilt. The U.S. imported their goods, giving them favorable currency terms under Brent Woods that later we get blamed for letting them catch up with, right? But 
they, uh, so they were, we were the, uh, we, we took in the world's surplus production. And sometime around 1980, we became the, uh, we absorbed the world's savings. And that's because of depth and breadth of our, of our treasury market, our asset market. Look at Chinese China today. They save roughly 50% of their income because in this worker's paradise, it's going to replace the United States. <coughs> they do not have health care. Well, we don't. Uh, they don't, ha they don't have a social security, unemployment. They don't have much of a social safety net. They've got to save for their retirement and for their sick days, rainy days, if you will. What about Europe? Could Europe absorb this money? I kind of think the European bond market, even though, of course, we talk about the Eurozone as a whole entity, but each country, I mean, this is, a, this is I think, the experiment of our age, is, is can you have monetary union without political union? And what that means in this, in this context is each country still issues its own bonds. It has its own convention when they do so, well, how, they, what they, how they term things. Their, their market, I'd say the European bond market is much more like the U.S. muni market. A lot of issuers tend to be small issuers, different tax schedules. It's not a homogenous market. So for me, the depth of the U.S. treasury market, we're not, it's not like we're doing this as goodwill to the world. We're benefiting from this. We, the foreign, foreign investors own about $3.5 trillion more of our stuff than we own of theirs. About $3.5 trillion. But every quarter, the U.S. gets paid for our investment income. So that is, when you really look at the numbers, here's what it looks like. Something like this. The U.S. pays roughly 3% on our liabilities. The world, it's borrowed money from the world, it's given it 3%. And it's reinvesting that same money. Sometimes in those same countries that gave it to us, that lent it to us, we're getting 4%. Typically when Americans invest overseas, they don't invest in fixed income. And typically until very recently, they don't invest in fixed income in the U.S. Yet when foreign investors invest in the U.S., they invest in primarily fixed income. So of course they get a lower return on their lower risk portfolio than we do as Americans investing in foreign equities. So for me, the U.S. is the U.S. has become bank of the world, and when we try to compare apples and oranges, we get stuck with this like messy pie. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, bear with me while I lay out my question here. We were getting ready to do the last fundamental economic question. Okay. But, so I'm going to get fundamental on here. Okay. We're talking about dollar competitiveness. The problem is the word competitive. We talk about us against them. Us having a big military. Compare our economy with the rest of the world's economy, you're coming from a mechanical world <coughs> view. We don't live in a world of separate countries. We live in one world with a global economy. If we crash or don't, and another part of the world crashes or don't, we affect each other. We're not isolated islands to ourselves. There's a mechanical approach towards looking at problems. It's called analysis. <laughs> What our culture is raised to believe is how you view the universe. It's like a bicycle is broken, looks at a broken part. But when you talk about a human global culture, you have to switch into what's called systems thinking, synthetic thinking instead of analysis, where you look at what could an economic system be that incorporates all of us winning, not us against them, not you know, big military matters because wars that you talk about being a peaceful person, I appreciate that. I used to be around peaceful people who said, we're going to have peace if we have to kill people to get it. <laughs> That's not real peace. Real peace is figuring out how to find common ground with the Chinese. Hillary Clinton gave a speech uh, not too long ago. She used the phrase creating an architecture of global cooperation. Brilliant speech because it, it was about laying out a new structure. So what I'd like you to consider, and this is not like I'm not blaming you. It really is a cultural challenge <laughs> to get ourselves thinking about a whole world solution, not just work for us, it is us against them. Okay. And you know, I'm a patriotic guy. And I heard a great quote from John Wayne recently. John Wayne once said, life is tough, and it's even tougher if you're stupid. <laughs> we live in a dumb culture because we think of this us as against them reality. So I'd like you to think and respond to the notion of coming up with a solution to this is actually to win-win rather than win-lose. You got, you, got, you got me. I'm definitely not smart enough to come up with a solution for this. What I'm really trying to do is just describe why, when I look at this situation with my left of center views, why I come away with the conclusion that America is more durable, the empire is more durable than 
than our enemies and many of our friends would think. That is why the U.S. Why the U.S. Why this isn't an existential crisis? Why uh, 2013 was still going to be around? Is primarily because of these elements of power. And I think that I think you're right. I, I like to live in your world. Right now, I have to live in this world where it's very competitive. And I have a problem. I'm going to tell you about this. Uh, I hear you. <laughs> 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 so, so I think there's a decades behind me of huge monthly trade deficits. I look into the future, I see decades of monthly huge trade deficits. And those trade deficits aren't investment. That's consumables, that's disposables. Uh, they're, they're, we're shipping value out, we're not going to value. I look at the government deficits that we, we fund with some of our bonds do offshore. That's not investment we get four percent back on. That's mostly disposable uh, throwaways too. Uh, I mean, I would love to put on my Pollyanna suit and say, "Gosh, this is all wonderful," but it's very hard for me to look into the future and see the benefit and durability of this. Right. It's got to crash at some point. Yeah, no, hey, look, think, look about those uh, iPods. iPods. Five years ago, I didn't know I needed an iPod. Right? <laughs> Every time you buy an iPod. Increase the U.S. trade deficit by roughly 150 U.S. dollars. How unpatriotic of us for buying iPods. No, that's not. See, this is this is where I think part of what my book tries to address is this is Adam Smith wrote about the inquiry into the origin of the wealth of nations, 1776, and what he said was that the origin of the wealth of nations does not lie in running trade surpluses. He specifically is arguing against those economists at that time who thought that trade surpluses were the key to nations' wealth. Exporting more than you import. <clears throat> that is not the key to wealth. The key to wealth was a division of labor, productivity. So I would say to you that, yes, the trade deficit, the way the government measures it, goes up $150 for that iPod I bought. But Apple accrues a lot of money that we're not really calculating. Not just me. The U.S. government is working on an alternative measure to current account. Because roughly, if you think about the U.S. trade deficit that worries you, roughly half of it can be accounted for by the movement of goods within the same factory. GM making a braking system up in Ontario, selling it to GM in Detroit. The U.S. government says that's a trade deficit. Half the trade deficit can be accounted for by things like that. I say, that's not a trade deficit. That's robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's, a glo that's what globalization means. You've got a virtual factory moving goods from one side of that factory floor to the other side of the factory floor. The government is using this antiquated measuring stick. The same measuring, the same, uh, measuring stick that I measured, I measured my son when he was three years old no longer applies it when he's 10 years old. Same thing with the balance of payments. The metrics got to change. The government's working on an alternative measure. You could find it in the survey of current business. You could uh, Google it or Bing it or whatever people do these days with it. Uh, and uh, survey of current business is probably the best free lunch on the web. But so my, my argument would be that the trade deficit is exaggerated. A lot of it is from ourselves. Movement of goods within that same factory. But it's not moving in the same factory. It was in Canada, which means it's Canadian labor made. The steel probably came from China. Uh, and what are we making? We're making a car, but it's also a disposable consumable item. So we've transferred wealth out and, <coughs> and we brought hamburgers in. Yeah, but I, I, I mean, I, I think that uh, for me, I would look at a uh, measure like having gotten poorer. During this crisis, it's true that household net worth, and that's not net worth that's assets and liabilities, mm -hmm. has fallen during the crisis. But before the crisis, it was going up every year. The household net worth peaked $57 trillion. In some years, it would go up more than the Chinese GDP. The 50, no, not just the bubble. You can, you can do it over the, it was, most recently with the bubble. I agree with you. But over the long run, 20, 30 years, our, per cap, our household net worth goes up. Per capita GDP goes up. We are not poor. Americans are living longer. Think about this. The house that you probably were born in, uh, say in the early 1950s, yeah, close. Uh, yeah. The, 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 average, the, the average house in the 1950s was about 1,100 square feet. The average house today, 2,200 square feet. You say, well, the price of houses went up. It's inflation. No, it gets the car that you buy today is not the same car we bought five years ago or ten years ago. Quality changes, and I really think that I'd be very hard pressed to say the U.S. has become any poorer since roughly 1980, when the U.S. began running current account deficits. What happened to the triumphalism at the end of the Cold War? What happened to the born again in America? Didn't we do something? Isn't America richer? Aren't we living longer than ever before? 
healthier and I think I think <laughs> To me, that's the role of government, is it help to, to make it so that we, we don't protect the buggy, we, we help the buggy maker transition, that's learning new skills, that's uh, at, at technical schools, junior colleges, colleges, retool, reskill people. The answer is not to make sure we still ride around in buggies. And so, I mean, I think that the most successful uh, apparel factories in the world now are in the Carolinas, they just don't hire many people, it's called productivity. When I was younger, I wanted a secretary. What has happened to all the secretaries? They've been replaced by Bill Gates, Microsoft Office Suites. What about tellers? That was a nice job for people when they got out of college. What happened to all the tellers? Replaced by ATM machines. This is a good thing. We've got to make sure that Americans can still embrace progress, which means to help them over these transitions. And the way capitalism works, we're constantly in transition. So for me, this is, they, they, unfortunately, you're right, that a lot of the apparel jobs are gone, a lot of car jobs are going to be gone, a lot of bank jobs are going to be gone. But you know what? China is losing manufacturing jobs. How can it be that Canada is taking our manufacturing jobs and Canada is losing manufacturing jobs? Industrialized countries are losing manufacturing jobs for the same reason we lost farmers, productivity. I don't want to go back to work on farms. This is one of the good things in the United States now. Over half of Americans, men and women in the workforce, were freed from physical toil. Yes, office, white collar jobs have their own drudgery. But it's not physical toil. We're freed from that in our generation, the last 50 years. One more question. How are you going to provide jobs that will give people a decent standard of living, the American standard of living? Uh, if the uh, population rise, if we export our industrial base and high technology, which is the growth area and the only area we can compete. Now, uh, how are you going to bring back that? The other thing is, if survival is not a very good country needs, the other thing is, you have the, uh, how do you have a serious society where a wealth-generating productive space? Yeah, that's I think probably a lot of people have anything. The U.S. has stopped manufacturing goods. We're a bunch of country, or a country now of pencil pushers, paper shuffers. And when you really look at the numbers, the U.S. manufactured, before this recession, the depression, what we're in, the U.S. is producing more goods than ever before. More goods, not just shuffling paper. The thing is, manufacturing. We, we, the U.S. manufactures more goods than any other country. The manufacturing sector itself is very big. I think what you're catching still is that unemployment has left there. But 20 years ago, who would have imagined that the, the computer industry? So we've got new industries that are coming. I can't, I can't forecast them. I just think that the well, general... Where are the revenues coming to support our military? to support the poor who can't earn a living, to support these government services like pensions, and when companies go broke, and American, and I pay a little and health care. Where is all that money coming from if we don't produce it? I think we are producing, not producing it. it with services. No, I, We're going to produce it with creating My part. dentist makes a lot of money. <laughs> My shrink makes a lot of money. Thank you very much. We're talking about the message. <laughs> no, but no, that's not, I'm kidding you. I mean, I think that services, Americans spend more money on services than they do on goods. They have to have money to spend it. So yes. where are they getting the money to spend? Right. Well, mm -hmm. you're right. Right now, the key to the fastest part of income that's growing is entitlements. Is a government. You got, think about what happened in January. Anybody who got Social Security got about a 5.3% increase. Then in May, they got another check for $250. Where's the government getting the money from? Right now, it's a fiscal stimulus. Right now, but I mean, remember what was happening though. If I was to speak here five years ago, Alan Greenspan, Robert Rubin were warning us we were running out of debt. We were running out of treasuries. And woe to America if we run out of treasuries. And so I think that these things, like I say, I don't know what I'm going to have for dinner tomorrow night. So I can't tell you what's going to happen five or ten years in the future. All I can tell you is that America has the elements of power, it's competing. In the world, it's still uh, the uh, World Economic Forum just came with a new listing. The U.S. is number two in the world. Uh, just slip a little Switzerland, partly because of this bailout that concerns you. We because slip it's money. Isn't it a sad state of affairs when you and I have a better net worth than the federal government? Yes, especially for me. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.